Folks, hello and welcome to Tavern Chat. I'm your host, Derek Tenkar, your bartender in the OSR. So, before we hop into the article, at the bottom of the screen is an affiliate link. Tenkars-tavern.games slash Pathfinder 2 bundle. It's a humble bundle link. Five bucks. You get the Pathfinder 2 beginner box in PDF. Um, you get the core book. You get the best area, a few other things. An amazing value. There's also uh, Cobalt and Friends, I believe, still live on Humble Bundle. Uh, that's OSR and 5e. Good stuff. Just wanted to throw it out there because the whole OGL thing. Now, I have a link up on the screen. I'm going to include the link to this and the original video. This is a link from Enworld. I've got to say Enworld's coverage of the OGL fiasco and calling it a fiasco is probably not doing it justice because it doesn't describe how stupid this played out. Um, they've been doing a great job. Props when it's deserved, really top-notch coverage. So uh, you can read. The, the, the comments are very good, by the way, on this post over at Enworld. You should go there. Again, links to that, links to the original article. Now, uh, or the original video. Now, my, my question with the video is, listen, I don't have a huge reach, all right? I've just, I've got over just uh, 20, 2,600, 2,620 subscribers. Uh, Brave Halflings has half that. And uh, Tia Sabadia has half that on YouTube. He may have more. And the Black Halflings may have more on uh, Spotify or whatever. But uh, as I have seen with my own podcast, the, the views, the listens, they're on YouTube. Okay, that's where folks go. That's where po folks gravitate. So, but Kyle is Kyle Banks. Sorry, Kyle Brinks is making the rounds. Uh, he, let's. Uh, he's a and D's executive producer. So between him and Cynthia, there's a vice president, and then Cynthia Williams. So now let's look at the uh, the recap. The recap is interesting, and I'm going to make a few points here. Company structure. There's around 30 people. And by the way, Morris did a great job breaking this down. The video might be a long one for folks to watch, but uh, well well done, Morris. There's around 30 people on the D&D &D team. That many, again, freelancers, but there's roughly 12 times that you know, just hired to work on the new VTT and I guess the Indy Beyond. Um, the hiring process is equity targets to bring in a representative sample of candidates after which it is the best candidate. My issue with that is hopefully the equity candidate is close to being your best candidate. Because if you're bringing in somebody who doesn't come close to your best candidate, then you're doing a disservice to gamers, regardless of uh, where they are on the racial or gender spectrum or whether they are um, disabled or not, if you're bringing in less than the best, you're doing a disservice. That's my opinion. Other people might disagree with me. That's just my stand on it. Um, there has been an increase in diversity in the pool of designers while maintaining quality. I don't know who the designers are that have been producing the last year or two of D&D &D releases, but judging from the sales figures I've heard quoted, and from feedback of people who've picked them up, they've been disappointing. Now, I would gather that these are not the new hires that are being thrown into that process, so it could be people that should be on their way out. I don't know. Um, Brinks reports to Dan Rawson, Senior VP of D&D, &D, who reports to Cynthia Williams, President. D&D &D Beyond is the front door to D&D &D on the web and will be even more so. It is the D and D website and will become more so. D and D Game Studio is Center for Game Content. Okay, I have to do a little bit more research into this one myself. D and D Beyond turns that into a play service. Content gets expressed in ways appropriate to an audience. Example: digital book, etc. This is where it applies to us. When I say us, uh, people that are concerned about the OGL, what's the, what's going on with it, what went on with it, and what the intents were. OGL Creative Commons. It was a surprise to some of the D&D team that the OGL might be changed. Partly that was about shielding them from distracting stuff. 
this makes sense now as to why uh, initially uh, our friends, myself, Bay Mike, and, and people that we know who have connections directly to the design team at Wizards of the Coast that works on D&D were told things like, oh, well, yeah, there might be some changes to the OGL, but it only applies if you opt in to the new 1.1. And if you stay with the, if you don't opt in, uh, it doesn't apply. You can still use the old OGL. And uh, that's why a lot of companies were talking about uh, splitting their corporate structure into two separate entities, one publishing under the 1.1, one publishing under the 1.0. This makes sense now why there was that miscommunication because the D&D team wasn't being told. Brings feels this was too strong a wall and their views might have been beneficial. They would have been beneficial because they were giving out wrong signals to the community. Some internal feedback from the D&D team reflected the views of external creators, but obviously they were ignored. The community's point of view was not the one winning internally because you were silencing voices. But may have been had there been more had had people that there have been able to speak more loudly. They weren't. And I'll go on to talk about there was a corporate culture where basically you just shut up. You're a peon, your opinion is not required. I don't want your opinion, just do your work. You're not here to give your opinion on the OGL. That's, what, that's what's being said without necessarily being said. Um, the worry was about new technologies and big companies. Brink's, Brink uses the VR example with you generated content but poor content control. They didn't want the term d to become that video porn game looking ahead. No. They didn't want Meta, Facebook, putting millions of dollars into a VTT that would have blown away Wizards of the Coast VTT. Let's just put it that way. So how do you prevent that? Oh, well, you can't do a VTT. They would, that would prevent somebody like, like, like Facebook, Microsoft, some other big company from getting into the field and using their SRD and making, an SR, making a game compatible possibly with D&D 1 or 1D&D. &D. The position now is that the community is the strongest weapon against that. The community always is the strongest weapon against that. The royalties were to discourage big companies from moving in and redefining D&D. &D. By drips and drips, they got the, to the wrong position. Well, yeah. Um, 750000 was a ceiling which they felt would not affect most creators and larger companies would deal with Wizards of the Coast. No, it affected the third-party companies that were the biggest competition to putting out quality material for 5e. Cobalt Press, Goodman, Frog God, Troll Lord, a few others. And uh, that was aimed at them specifically because their content is embarrassingly good compared to the content that's officially coming out of Wizards of the Coast. Right now, they're looking at protecting D&D via things that things not now in the Creative Commons. So, they are going to add rules, mechanics to 1D&D that will not be in the Creative Commons. So, the compatibility between 1D&D and 5E is, is a myth. Okay? Just putting it out there. Community protects the open spaces, which of the Coast protects copyright and trademark. Fair enough. They feel the community is able to take care of hateful content. Always has been, always will be. They want the creator community. A deal where Wizards of the Coast got more powers to act but lost the creator community was not a good deal. Where Wizards of the Coast got more powers to act was probably not a good deal in and of itself. But NFTs are not the concerns about how people use them for scams. Well, that would have been nice if they explained that, but they didn't. And the fact that Hasbro is doing their own NFTs made you think that it's about cornering the NFT market for D&D. Wizards of the Coast will be publishing a content policy for representation, hateful content, etc., and hold themselves to it. They cannot hold others to it. That is great. That is awesome. And now I hope that with the forthcoming Orc license, the Whispers, the uh, handful of uh, 
companies that I've heard of that are demanding such a, a clause be added to the ORC. I hope they see what Wizards of the Coast decided to do and just shut up. You can edit to your own content. You can make it a, a requirement for your own SRD. Don't make it uh, something that for other companies that don't need it and communities that don't need it. The Creative Commons license chosen lack of share-alike attribution isn't a problem for Wizards of the Coast. Why would it be? Why would it be for them? They don't care. They want people to build stuff they own and don't have to share and build value in their own IP. If it's share and share alike, well, it can become viral. If it isn't, it doesn't become viral. There's something to that too. They've chosen a robot which gets created, created the choice and can make any of their content share alike, but Wizards of the Coast isn't forcing them to. Fair enough. I understand that. But they don't like the share and share alike because it makes other content viral. Creative Commons means that nobody has to take Wizards of the Coast word for anything if they don't control the license. I laugh at that because nobody's taking Wizards of the Coast word for anything. The drive to change the OGL is coming from various parts of the organization. Legal, business, studios, an ongoing effort when Drink arrived. I believe that. The faster the audience grew, the bigger the risk that hateful content or scams would arise. So there's a rising sense of urgency to take action. Now, the next one is interesting. <coughs> Did anyone sign the 1.1 version? It was distributed with an NDA and with some creators, a discussion about other arrangements licenses they might make separate from the OGL. That's not an answer, but it is an answer. It was distributed with an NDA, which means those that signed it can't speak about it. Even if the license is not going to be considered valid, the NDA is. There you go. The impression someone could get that I have to sign version 1.1 is absolutely a believable impression for somebody to get. It's the only impression I saw. The design of version 1.1 was always going to be an ongoing no-signature process. Again, just take a look at the evidence. Decide for yourself. Feedback from larger creators like Cobra Press the failing is on Wizards of the Coast for not communicating that they were listening. Thanks for the feedback isn't enough. Thanks for the feedback means you aren't listening. If you're going to write a new OGL, protect yourself from the vulnerabilities of the old, you kind of have to take the old OGL off the table. Otherwise, you're not protecting yourself at all. There's no point in changing the OGL if you don't deauthorize the old one. Exactly, because that's how it's written, right? It's written that you can use whatever OGL you want to use any authorized or, or official version of D&D that is released with an authorized version of the OGL. The simpler solution would be what they did with 4E, called a game system license, called the uh, one, the ODL, the ODDL, the one D&D license. Okay? Just don't call it an open game license. That's all. They weren't worried about competitors arising from within the community. They already had that. They were trying to cap those. They love the creator community and Wizards of the Coast can't satisfy all appetites. That serves the broad need of the player community. But they still wanted a piece of that money. It was money on the table. Again, what is Bank of America talking about? I did a video on that. They're talking about, they're going from being claiming that they've under-monetized the D&D IP and now Bank of America saying between Magic the Gathering and D&D, they're over-monetizing, looking for short-term short -term gains at the expense of long-term profits. All right. They want to have close relationships with the most successful creators, talking about licenses and going big, getting bigger. The tiering structure was meant to identify those creators. The tiering structure was meant to identify what was hot, what was selling, because they weren't asking creators Oh, when he, once you've sold 50000 in, in anything. No, they wanted to know when you when they have one, one thing. You've got to sell 50000 What's hot? Tell us. We're looking at a breakdown. Now you have to give us a breakdown of everything you're selling. Once you have 50000 right? So if you sell 50000 and uh, somebody, like somebody like James Bond and, I don't know, 45000 coming from White Star, well, then obviously, Wizards of the Coast has to do a space opera game. 
Right? Simple enough. That's what they were looking for. The way it was executed was very clearly going to be an attenuating, destructive structure, which we did not want. If it was clearly going to be that, then why did you set it up that way? <coughs> I love the facts that we did this, but it was so bad that we did this. Uh, it's not what we wanted. But yeah, this is what you put in our initial offering because it's what we wanted at the time. The OGL, OGL survey results were clear from a range of people, 15,000 responses. The intent was to treat it like a play test. It was obvious is what, where it was going. The survey feedback supported Creative Commons and there was no reason to drag it out. Wizard of the Coast still has their concerns, but their approach to it has changed to a combo of copyright, trademark, and community. Putting D&D into Creative Commons has made deauthorizing the OGL unimportant to Wizards of the Coast. It's something to that at this time. It's unimportant to Wizards of the Coast at this time until we decide we want to offer an OGL with one D and D. And if we're going to call it an OGL, we have to go back and unauthorize the prior ones. The SRD will be updated to continue to be compatible with evolving rules. Do you think that the SRD is going to be uh, compatible with? Uh, one D and D. No, I don't see that. They're looking at adding the 3.5 SRD to the SRD. I, I believe to the Creative Commons, but they have to remove the content. They have to review the content to make sure they're not accidentally putting stuff into the Creative Commons. Which, by the way, already has happened. Uh, company culture: people being afraid to speak up is a sign of immature management and leading from ego. That is what 1.1. 1 .1 2.0 and 1.2 were. Okay, it's not until the adults came into the room that we got rid of that shit. That's not the kind of leaders which of the Coast has today. Really? Well, Brink has to say what Brink has to say. He cannot speak about those that were there before he arrived, but the culture was certainly there. Brink feels that every month he's there, people feel more comfortable speaking up, although that doesn't mean no always agree, but they will listen. That's not how we operate today, but I cert can certainly believe echoes of that in the past. Okay. Now, VTTs. Roll 20 and Fancy Grounds are important to the hobby and Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast is also making digital play spaces. The goal is to give more choice. And the way Wizards of the Coast succeeds is that they make the best stuff. Yes. Exactly. They haven't been. And they were looking to really curtail that competition. The license that Roll20, etc. has to sell Wizards of the Coast content still applies. Caveat. Remains to be seen down the road. It is possible that third-party content will be seen inside uh, DDB or the VTT. Mm, it's going to take a lot of work. So it's going to have to be really good stuff for that to happen. 1D&D. &D. The OGL issue has not impacted the 1D&D &D strategy. It may have helped Wizards of the Coast express their plans publicly. d and should be a living game which evolves but is familiar. Familiar. Evolves but is familiar. It doesn't even mean compatible. Again. The 1D&D &D timeline has not changed, but the playtest timeline has impacted, but was impacted by the OGL situation. They will get back on track real soon. A professional research team Gathers the survey information. Fair enough. Does it mean they read everything? No, but they're gathering numbers. I, I did statistics uh, as a cop. I did comp stat. Okay? And when you go to the meetings, nobody wants to know the narrative of the crimes that happened. Nobody cares. They wanted to know robberies are up, grand larcenies are down. Right? That's what they want to know. They want the quick synopsis. Cynthia Williams doesn't want to know that uh, some gamer on their survey said, uh, you know, OSR forever, uh, 5e sucks. Why are you fucking with my OGL? They don't care. That's it. Uh, there are also internal play tests with robust feedback. Other, the game team, the game team has gained more of a voice. All right, we'll accept that. More trust has been built between design leadership and the executive team. 
I don't know about that. Because there was an issue. I don't believe the, the higher-ups really knew that this was going to happen. Dan Rawson's role is new. It's the first time the D&D brand has been represented at that level, at the executive level. Vice President, D&D. Cynthia Williams is empathic and data-oriented and willing to change direction. Data-oriented, I'm telling you again. She doesn't want to hear the stories of gamers. She doesn't want to hear why 92% of our audience is pissed at us. That's to it. That, that's, and that's great. That's the data she wants to see. I understand it. I used to have to brief people on data. Okay? Again. And then she's empathic. She's not sympathetic. Don't think she's sympathetic to the gamers. She's empathic because she needs to understand why they're upset, because them being upset might affect profitability. It sounds like they'd consider the SRD being placed into French, German, Italian, Spanish. Uh, you have to add Portuguese to that, I think, because a lot of Brazilian gamers. So overall, it's, uh, it's, it's answers. I'm not saying they're necessarily all good answers, but they are answers. And this is all giving us a bit of an insight into what was going on behind the scenes. And what was going on behind the scenes, in my opinion, <clears throat> was a very dysfunctional uh, situation where the, the design team and the suits were not talking. And the design team had no input or little voice or little insight into what the suits were talking about. And they were probably as surprised as everybody else when the OGL came out. Go figure that one out. Again, I'll include links to this in the show notes. Both this article and Emerald, again, read the comments. They're, they're pretty insightful. There's pretty good talk going on there. And uh, watch the original video. Put all this into context. Folks, on that note, uh, tonight is hey, it Thursday. If, if you happen to be on our Discord server at 9 o'clock Eastern, we do a hangout and a speakeasy. At first, yes, Kitty. I know. She's like, who are you talking to? It's a very relaxed situation. Again, link on the bottom of the screen. If you want to uh, support the tavern, that's an affiliate link. I will I will pin that as a pinned comment to this video. And other than that, be safe, be well. God bless. Roll those dice. Roll them well. Uh, I'll be back with the live stream tomorrow with a random party generator. I'm sure we'll have interesting topics. And that's 8 p.m. and Saturday at 8 p.m. myself. My lovely wife, Rach, episode of Gamers Help. All right, folks. Thank you. God bless.